Vaden Earl, welcome to The Signal. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. What brings you to town? I'm in town. Uh, new venture I'm on with a humanity called Humanity International. It's a humanitarian charity. And uh, doing some meetings here in St. John's. And we're going to do an event next week to raise some awareness and hopefully raise some support for some of our global projects. Excellent. And through the course of this conversation, we're going to get into the humanitarian side of things. And give folks the touch of a backstory because you're uh, you're not living here now, but you're from here. So just tell us a, just a slight here. bit about you before we get into some of the other uh, big questions I have. About me uh, when I was from here, you yeah, mean? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, I grew up on the very tip of the northern peninsula, the metropolis of St. Lanier Gricket. And uh, even people from Newfoundland often don't know where that is. So uh, we put that place on the map for those that thought there was nothing north of St. Anthony. Excellent. So right up by the Vikings. We've covered you and your family before. Yes. Right? So CBCNL uh, covered your family story about a reunification. And this was last the last online story I saw was around 2020. Can you remind folks about this? Yeah. So uh, you guys covered us a few years before that when yeah. we were struggling to get out of Dominican Republic uh, with the whole immigration thing. When we got home, so the last one that you saw in 2020 would have probably been Bernice Hillier. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was when we made it back to Canada. So it was right. a, for us, uh, it was a 12-year-long journey to get back to Canada. Of that, I lived 10 years full-time in Dominican Republic. Well, start us at the beginning of that All right, one. well, <clears throat> it's, uh, I was running a humanitarian aid organization that I had founded, and we were based in Hamilton, Ontario. One of our projects was in Dominican Republic, um, Another was in Haiti. And as you know, the island is split into the two countries. And if you watch the news now, it's, I mean, it's, it, Haiti's falling apart. It's on yeah. fire right now. Uh, but there's always been animosity between the two countries. So in Dominican Republic, and I hate to ruin people's lunch today with this, but wherever there's all-inclusive resorts and that much waste, there's always garbage dumps and there's always people living in them. Anywhere in the world you go where there's all-inclusive tourism, you got people living in the garbage dumps. That's just life because we waste so much food at the buffets. Yeah. It winds up in the landfill and there's those disenfranchised folks that, that that's the only food that they have access to. And um, so just like that, we had a project happening in Dominican Republic and we found that there's about 100 Haitians living in and around that dump. So we thought we would add that as part of what we did. Mm. So we, uh, we reached out and we would bring, we bring these teenagers from North America to these projects. And uh, one of our, our things we did was called a day in their shoes. And we would have a teenager, some young strapping 14 year old Canadian boy, pair him off with some lady living in a garbage dump in, in the Dominican Republic. And he would help her recycle for the whole afternoon because they would recycle uh, cans and, and bottles and stuff. And they could get about a buck for a plastic bag taller than me. Well, we'd get these young kids and we'd challenge them who can get the most. So, you know, we would probably triple or quadruple their income for the day. Uh, while at the dump, though, we met a lady who was there recycling and she had a two-year-old on her arm. It stood out. You don't expect to see a toddler in a garbage dump, right? You see people that are looking pretty rough and they look like, you know, they're, they're homeless or whatever. But to see a toddler in that setting stood out to us. Uh, so we got to know the kid and over the course of the next couple of years, got to know the mother and the family and just became part of our culture there. Uh, fast forward a little, the mother passed away and the little girl was sent to Haiti because the grandmother just couldn't afford to, to feed another mouth. Uh, her prospects in Haiti were grim, possibly just being sold as a household servant. And that's just kind of the culture there. So we decided, let's adopt her. So it um, sounded like a great idea. Mm -hmm. And it sounded glorious and very Angelina Jolie-esque of us, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But ultimately, it came down to um, we. our message this entire career has been, what would you give up if you could save someone else or help somebody else in need? Well, this was rubber meets the road time. Yeah. So found her in Haiti, did the, the process, got a lot of help from the Canadian government at the time to get the adoption fast-tracked. And we were at the finish line in December of 09. And it was December 15th. And that date, ironically, is important because Haiti takes an entire month for Christmas. They party, mm. for, the, the government shuts down for a month, which is, if you think about it, you get 11 months of the year to work and one to party. It's not a terrible deal. Um, <clears throat> so they shut down. So we signed the final paperwork on the 15th of December 09. They said, okay, when we come back on the 16th of January, we'll file it. Two weeks, you can fly to Canada, start your new life. The next chapter with this little girl, um, moving on. So as we know now, on the 12th of, of January that year, the earthquake happened. Yeah. Estimated 315,000 people dead. 
Uh, I was I brought a team as one of the first responders after the earthquake, and the first place I stopped was the Department of Child and Family Services, where I signed the paperwork two two or three weeks earlier. I thought I got to go and see, and I went, and this beautiful ornate three story building stood about chest high. It just flattened, and I knew at that moment my life was over. Like my life as I knew it was over. Yeah. So uh, we came to realize that our paperwork was destroyed. All of our caseworkers that worked on the adoption were killed. And any memory of us having legally adopted her was gone. And the Canadian government who approved the adoption prior wouldn't process the immigration paperwork without the, the Haitian side. And we couldn't, we couldn't re replicate that. So it was over. So Haiti put a three-year moratorium on adoptions. And by the time that was over, because of the child trafficking and stuff that happens yeah. after a, um, a disaster, well, our Canadian paper approval expired in three years, which happened just before. So we, we were lost in no man's land. So we knew we were stuck and um, decided if you're going to get stranded and stuck somewhere, get stranded and stuck where there's nice beaches, I guess. I don't know. So we decided we'd live in Dominican Republic with, with our daughter. And um, that'd be that. Huh. And, gonna, you know, we're going to sponsor her in as an adult at 18 years old, I guess, because immigration wasn't really coming to the table to help us. And that was kind of one of those, you know, make the decision, hope it all pans out. Uh, at the time, uh, my wife and I had separated and divorced right after kind of the whole earthquake thing happened. So I'm there and um, my, my new wife at this point, we're like, we're living there. We lean is there and life's happening. It's great. Um, had a couple businesses. We were making ends meet. You know, I sold cigars for a living. I smoked most of my profits, but it was great. <laughs> um and then in 2016, the Dominican Republic introduced a legislation which uh, Amnesty International has said is one of the biggest hits on human rights violations in the Western Hemisphere has ever seen. And basically, they, they said that well, they, they're trying to get rid of the Haitians from the country. Three and a half million Haitians living in Dominican. They want to get rid of them. They don't like each other. Yeah, this goes back to what you are saying in the beginning, right? That's right. It's a divide island, but there's a lot of issues back and forth. Tons of animosity. And it's the same thing everywhere you go where there's a country that's doing a little better than another country that yeah. borders it. The country from the poorer country or the people from the poor country go there and do the jobs mm -hmm. that nobody in the rich country wants to do anyways. But there's always that animosity. We get it in Canada with migrant workers. I mean, we see it all the time. Uh, California has it with Mexicans coming up and picking avocados. It's, it's the same thing, but more extreme. And, um, yeah, so they passed the legislation, and we weren't concerned, honestly. I've never seen the Dominican government enforce anything they've passed before. Just, yeah. They're not really aggressive. And a year later, they bought 36 school buses, took the windows out, retrofitted them with cages, and they, they hired 1,100 police or, or reconstituted them from other police departments. And they started going city to city and violently deporting all the Haitians. I mean, they were picking up people— throwing him in the back of these cages. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this to you, and it's going to sound like it's made up, but you can verify this. I promise you this is real. They had a card, a laminated card with seven shades, and they'd hold it to your face. And if you're darker than shade number three, you're deported. That right. skin color was their primary metric. Um, it was the most hideous thing you've ever seen. And we've got a daughter who is very Haitian. Um, you know, although she was born in Dominican Republic— all of a sudden, we're in danger. And yeah, and on that card, she'd be on the the, the one. The, the yeah, you know, she's yeah, she's yeah. she's a she's a very dark skinned Haitian, yeah. and um, yeah, and and we watched them come through town. I remember at our cigar lounge one day, and she wasn't with us. Thank God. It's like there's a hustling, bustling area, tourist area, and all of a sudden, everything got quiet. Mm. And my wife is like, "What is going on?" We look outside, and we see these these Haitian girls. It's later at night. The clip clop, clip clop, but they're like high heels and stuff running. And behind them, there's heavily armed military chasing them down. And we were hiding them in our lounge and locking them in the bathroom and stuff, trying to save them from deportation. We watched these guys deport two of our clients in our cigar lounge from Brooklyn. These guys are wearing $1,500 Air Jordan 1s. They're not Haitian. They yeah. couldn't they'd speak English, and but they were just too black. And that's literally what they use as a metric. And uh, it, was, it was an atrocity. And we knew at that point... Uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, we're like, in a we lot got, of we got to make some changes now. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, so I, I reached out. I had a lot of friends that were members of parliament, and I reached out to them all. And um, I just couldn't seem to get traction with Immigration Canada. 
And I pushed and pushed, and we got a movement going. And we're fortunate. I mean, actually, a lot to do with the media here in Newfoundland that broke the story. You guys and NTV and VOCM and everybody got, got on board because I'm from here uh, and broke the story. And it went national. It went international. And before I know it, Ellen DeGeneres is talking about it. Richard Branson's calling my cell phone. Like, I mean, it really got attention. And um, the attention was great, except... The attention was bad because now all of a sudden we're not just the white couple in Dominican Republic with the Haitian daughter. We're the white couple in Dominican Republic with the Haitian daughter telling the world about human rights violations. Yeah, you're in, airing stuff in some pretty uh, high yeah, level places that they don't, you know, wouldn't want they, to, they like, don't to want, have that conversation out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm aggressive by nature. Like if I get sink my teeth into something, I want to go until I get to the bone, you know. And I was on TV talking about it, and you, you've probably seen the clips. W5 did a documentary on us, and um, there was even talks of a Netflix thing. And, I mean, it got wild. So it got to the point where our little guy was about to be born. So we have, we have another child now, Luther. Uh, so Nikki and I, Nikki's my wife, and uh, he's about to be born. Now, I told her, you're not having this baby in Dominican Republic. We are so vulnerable now to, to sabotage. To I've been arrested a bunch of times and beaten by the cops and stuff by now. Like So there's no way we're going to subject you in a hospital bed, can't move with a little infant. Like They have us. Yeah. So uh, And the, the healthcare is not that great anyway. So we just said, you got to go home to have Luther. So she comes back to Canada. We had bought a house uh, in, uh, in southern Ontario based on a promise from Trudeau that we'd be home in 30 days, three years before. <laughs> so that didn't work out so well. Um, we bought a house, so we had a place to go. So Nikki came home, and it was about a week or two before the scheduled birth, and I get a call from Global Affairs Canada. And I'm like, this could be great, because I've been lobbying these guys yeah. to help us get out. And I'm like, this is good news. And they said, uh, Mr. Earl, do not board a plane. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they said, we just got a, a wire or something, a, a feed that you've been added to an international criminal list. Dominican Republic's got a warrant for you. And they're trying to do you for 20 years. I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm flattered. What did I do? That's worth 20 mm-hmm. years. And so we, when we drilled down to the bottom of it, they had experienced a huge dip in tourism money, or income. Um, and it was around the time that I was running around the countryside talking about human rights violations. I, I'm flattered. I, they're giving me more credit. I don't have that kind yeah. of power. But um, they conflated my media campaign with their dip in tourism. And uh, that's, that's millions and maybe billions for them, right? So they just said, we're going to make this dude pay. So they, they couldn't they didn't do anything that was illegal, I mean, apart from hiding a Haitian, I suppose. So in our story of bringing Woodleen back from Haiti to Dominican Republic, which I've told publicly a million times, they said, well, we haven't seen any paperwork. So I guess technically he trafficked her. Hmm. So that's, they're going on a radio story that I told, a clip that they had out of context to say, oh, he's a human trafficker. I mean, meanwhile, I literally wrote a book on anti-human trafficking. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, so they're saying I'm a trafficker and they want to hit me for 20 years and put me away. And this is to shut me up and keep me out of the media. So it got, I mean, it got pretty dicey at that point. Um, I did get home for Luther's birth. Um, one of the airlines that, that we worked with continually, um, uh, they played with the manifest information. So they would put me down on a manifest as flying out of one city, but then actually flying me out of a different city. Oh, right. So just to keep like, kind of do bait and switch, right? We did that 82 times for the duration of when I was there. We flew, I flew out under arrest. My photo was at the kiosks in every airport. Uh, 82 times and didn't get caught except once. I got caught once. Uh, and I got out of it, but uh, 81 for one is not that bad, I suppose, when you're on the most wanted list. That's but, pretty good. But it's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I, I say it now and I joke, but I was my, my stomach ulcers had ulcers. You know, it was, it was really stressful for our family. I mean, you think about going down the road, and if the wrong car comes around the corner, that's the end of your life. That's yeah. really it. So that was kind of what we lived on there for three years before, before COVID happened. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, it was something. Let me tell you. So, how did things kind of finally end, like in the in the, in the positive way that that they did end? It was. I mean, it was quite dramatic. We had uh, at this point now we had a team down there that were filming for a potential Netflix documentary, and um, the only way we could see forward to get out of there was. Uh, and again, this sounds very Hollywood, very cloak and dagger sort of thing, but we had we'd found a former Navy SEALs team. Yeah. 
and that they specialized in extractions of diplomats during crisis. So if there's a war, like for example, right now in Gaza, these guys are busy because they're pulling high-valued people out of Gaza. Um, so they've got their jets and their military and they go in over nighttime. They cut us a deal, a 50% discount. It was only going to cost me 96000 US to come in at night and fly us out of that country. And I was, raise, I was raising money to do this. This wasn't public, obviously, because mm. we couldn't be public with these guys. It was all like encrypted phones and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I was about 20K from, from my target to raise it. And this was uh, December of 19, 2019, so just before COVID. And uh, we had gone to Supreme Court. And this it, it gets really interesting because when we went to Supreme Court, um, we were there to say that we had been treated unfairly by the Canadian government and that she's been in our care Canadian citizens. She's been our, our daughter for 10 years. And even by de facto, if you don't have paperwork to say she's our daughter, we've got 10 years of history. Yeah. And we're trying to lobby the Supreme Court to say Immigration Canada has not been fair to us. And the, the then Minister of Immigration sought counsel from one of his, his legal advisors. And this is what they told him to do to kind of get rid of me, basically. They said, because she has a fake passport. She has a fake Haitian passport. I know it's fake. I bought it on the dark web. I mean, I paid to have it. It's not a good fake. It's very poorly done. But it's a fake passport. And on the side of the road, when you don't have a scanner, maybe it gets you by. They said, if you can prove that passport is real, then that makes her Haitian and makes her Haiti's problem. Hmm. But if the earls say that the passport's not real and Haiti won't give her citizenship and Dominican won't give her citizenship, then she's stateless. And now she is Canada's problem because she's in the care of Canadian citizens. So that was kind of the crux of the whole matter. That was the fight between us and immigration was that they're saying she's Haitian and I'm saying she's stateless. Yeah. And if she's stateless, Canada has an obligation. If she's, ha if she's Haitian, well, Haiti has the obligation. And so he sought legal counsel and, and they went to the Supreme Court and they said under oath, well, the passport's real. We had it verified in Haiti. It's a real passport. I mean, the thing looks like it was made with crayons. It's not a real <laughs> passport, but they, they went to the wall and um, – and decided to go under oath and say it was real. So that's there, and that's that's you know, hanging out there. So December of 2019, I'm 20,000 away from being able to get this very dramatic extraction. All I can think of now is I hope there's cameras running on this thing because this is going to be very like Jason Bourne, right? This is going to be cool. Uh, we just need to get out of there. But I, it's one of those things you don't ever expect in your own life. Mm. Uh, a cover of darkness extraction by Navy SEALs. I mean, this is too crazy, right? Yeah, Give me that's, a parachute. that's up there. The only way it gets better is if I got a parachute. <laughs> of course, I'd be the guy that throws on the backpack and just jumps. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, December uh, 10th of 2019 is where everything really changed for us. And we were going to school. Uh, my wife was going to bring Woodley to school, and I don't know if she wasn't feeling great. We had a routine. One of us would bring Woodley to school, hit the gym, which is by the school, come back, and then we'd switch. Uh, unless some days we would both go. But from, she wasn't feeling well. For whatever reason, last second, I'm going to drive her to school. And we've been very cognizant of the dangers and the roadblocks and the military. And it's been three years at this point, and we hadn't really gotten pinched uh, we've been close, and this one time, I don't know if I was changing the radio station in the car or distracted or just maybe not awake yet, mm. but I came around a corner, and I didn't see the roadblock. I got too close, and I didn't see it, and all of a sudden, when Lean sees it, she goes, is that what I think it is? I'm like, and my heart sank. I'm like, I, got, I could read the words on the back of the bus. I'm like, see the cages. I'm like, oh, man, we're we're done. She starts, like, you know, shrieking and stuff. I'm like, just just stay down. We'll get out of this. And I pull up as if I'm going to pull over for them. They're very armed. And last second, I, I try and do a U-turn. Mm. But I don't go wide enough. So now I'm in the ditch. And I'm, I've got a Honda Accord. I'm spinning mud everywhere. I'm trying to get out of this ditch. And I'm rocking this car. And it catches. And they're chasing me. But now, because it's a roadblock, there's traffic backed up for miles behind me. So I've got to go now into the oncoming lane and try and get around these guys. And I'm trying to get sped up. And they're chasing me on foot. And I can't go very fast. And I look. And... I think it was in that moment that I realized that this has gone beyond let's let's see justice for, you know, they believed she's not supposed to be in the country, so she's got to leave. They're trying to get justice, and I believe she needs to be in Canada. I'm trying to get justice. It all changed. He caught me. Yeah. The one soldier caught up to me. I'm like, he's, I look in my mirror. He's right there. I'm like, he's, if he wants to come around to the front, stick the barrel of his M16 in my face, I'm going to have to stop. He didn't. He shoulders his weapon, and he points it right at Woodleen. I'm mm -hmm. like... They're not going to try and deport us right now. They've got another agenda. Yeah. So I'm like, 
I, I just grab her, I throw her to the floor, and I floor it. I'm hitting motorbikes. I'm hitting, yeah. like, you know, moto taxis and stuff. I'm bouncing ping pong off school buses. And I finally get away, and I see they come behind me on motorcycles. Now we got a high-speed chase. And these guys are pointing weapons at us in a high-speed chase. And I'm like, it's like the first time I've left my house in three years and didn't carry a gun on me. Because I had to. It sounds crazy, but we didn't go to the grocery store without a, a gun on us just to yeah. protect our children or our child at the time. I'm like, Luther is, is one years old, one year old. He's at our house. Nikki's at our house. Me and Woodleen are cha being chased by these guys. And I knew there's an S-curve coming up. So I thought, if I can get around this S-curve, maybe they'll keep going straight. Mm -hmm. So I did. And we tuck in behind this pizza shop and we're both sitting there. Shut the car off. And you can almost hear your heart, like a Edgar Allan Poe sort of thing, right? Your heart's just pounding. And they went by us. So we ditched the car. We walk home. And I picked up the phone and I called up everybody that I knew. And I said, I need $20,000. I need it now. Like, I can't wait to raise this money. And we called up the Navy SEALs team. And we just said, guys, whatever it takes. Uh, I'll sell a kidney. I'll, whatever. We, well, let's, we have to do this now. So we, we, we jumped that forward. It was planned right after Christmas. And then all of a sudden, this COVID thing starts. And now they're getting called away to do full price gigs in Southeast Asia where, you know, we're right. So they're getting, they're getting busy. I'm like, guys, I got to get out of here. And what, what did it to answer your question in a really long sort of way, sorry. Um, what did it was when, when Trudeau announced the state of emergency and he did that, that, uh, press conference in front of the cam the cabin that we all remember. Yeah. And he said, you know, if you're Canadians and you're, you're living abroad, it's time to come home. And we're like, and he listed exemptions and he listed adopted children. I'm like, they're not, they don't recognize her adoption. That's not going to help us. So um, I called in. They said no. And that night, my phone did a weird ring, a funny beep I've never heard before. I look at it and it, it comes from some number that doesn't make any sense. It's like 40 numbers, right? Mm. I'm like, hello. And she goes, don't talk. Just listen. Okay. <laughs> I'm calling you from an encrypted phone. I work inside Trudeau's government. There's another exemption for Canadians coming home that they didn't talk about on TV. I'm going to take a picture of my computer because if I save it or print it, it'll be traced to me. I'll lose my job, likely go to jail. Mm. I'm like, okay, I'm listening. And she proceeded to take a photo and send it to me on this software. And it's an exemption for dependent children of Canadian citizens. Well, Woodleen is a dependent child of Canadian mm. citizens. Not she, adopted not or adopted. recognized as adopted, but dependent. That's right. Yes. Clearly a dependent child. And she says, call the MP that's been helping you. Um, there's a, a liberal MP that's been helping us, and he's right here in Newfoundland. Scott Sims actually was helping us, wow. and he'll know what to do when he sees this piece of paper, this this letter. We sent it. Scott called in his, uh, his staff late at night, and it, because it wasn't an immigration thing, it was a CBSA, a family reunification visa, it didn't alert the people in immigration that were kind of keeping us at arm's length. Hmm. So we got all this stuff. They courier a visa over to the embassy. Like, we're going to go. There's a one rescue flight left, and we're going to be on it, and we're cracking champagne and whatever. And I get a phone call from the ambassador in Santo Domingo, and she says, Vaden, we, we know each other quite well, obviously, from what's Through all of that, yeah, 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 of, of course. course. And she goes, Vaden, I have a visa for Woodleen. I'm like, I know, right? She goes, but I have a problem. I'm like, what's the problem? I'm thinking, why? She said, um... I know her passport's fake. I can't put a visa in a fake passport. I'm, that's like fraud. Mm. I'm like, I'm like, give me an hour. Let me get back to you. I'm trying to think, what am I going to do to give her cover to be able to do this? Because I, we, we finally hit the finish line. I cannot let yeah, this technicality there. keep us from, you know, being safe. And I, I reached out to a couple people in, in, uh, in the government that were friendly to us. And we came up with a very simple solution. I'm like, it's fake. The passport's fake. Of course it's fake. But we have a Supreme Court document where the Minister of Immigration said it was real. Mm. And he, you answer to him. So if it's real to him, it's real to everybody. So that gave her cover to say, ah, if the immigration minister says it's real, pop, popped it in, sent us with a diplomatic escort to fly home. So we flew home and landed, ironically, at Trudeau Airport in, <laughs> in Montreal, which, I mean, I've never, never ceased to see the irony in that. Mm. And uh, we landed there. And it was – everyone's excited, but I'm thinking to myself now – we got through through all these weird circumstances, and the Dominican customs, they didn't care. There's a Haitian leaving the country. They're not going to scrutinize us. One more that's gone. Montreal, 
they're going to know a fake passport from a real passport. Mm. This is a, a real, you know, immigration setup. Plus, we land at four in the morning. There's like 15 stalls for immigration there, but we're coming on a repatriation flight for Canadian citizens. So there should be no immigrants, but the embassy had to reach out and say, there's one immigrant coming. Mm. Open one stall in immigration. So it's dark, and there's one stall open in the middle of 15. I'm like, they're going to scrutinize the snot out of this. They're gonna, I mean, you know how it is, right? When you go through a busy kind of, even security at an airport, if it's super busy, they rustle you through real fast. But at small airports where they're not busy, they want to look at your shampoo and your shaving cream and you're one milligram over and they throw you out. We're going to get scrutinized. I'm thinking this is it. I'm going to jail right now for sure. And um, we go up and this guy is so smiley and he's so happy and he's kind of jumping up and down. He's like, you must be the Earls. You must be with Lean. I'm so happy to see you. And I'm like... This is too good. <laughs> Where's, when's the other shoe going to drop, right? And and sure enough, he stamps everything. He says, we took the liberty to curry you a, curry your, a, a student visa. I know you didn't apply for one, but you're going to have to go to school. So we sent a student visa to your house in Kingsville. I'm like, yes, bye. okay, what's going on here? Like, this, is, this ain't happening. And we leave the airport, and nobody's arrested us or beaten us up or shot at us. I'm like, whoa. And we're sitting waiting for an Uber. And I remember my phone buzzed. And I get it. And it's a girl that used to work in our cigar shop in Dominican Republic. I knew she was living back in Canada. I didn't know where. And she goes, I hear Woodleen is in Canada. And we hadn't told anybody mm. because we know, like, if this goes through social media and bleeds its way back through immigration, we're going we're gonna to get stopped. Yeah. And um, I'm like, how did you know? And she says, and this is where it gets, uh, the serendipitous nature of this whole story is, is pretty extreme. But this one, I, I can't even believe it. She says, the guy at immigration that stamped you through is my husband. They put out for overtime shifts and they said, one Haitian immigrant coming from Dominican Republic with a Canadian family. And he's like, it's got to be with Lena. So he actually applied for the shift because he wanted to be the guy letting us through. He followed her campaign for years. He even donated to our campaign. So this guy was there and he didn't. He's not going to scrutinize the passport. He's just high-fiving us as we go through. So anybody else could have been a different ending. Wow. But isn't that wild? Like, that I mean, is, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how, that's what got us to Canada. COVID brought us to Canada, which is, you know, I suppose you look at some silver lining in that giant cloud. Talk about, like, time and place and circumstance and things influencing uh, life from the earthquake and all that, of, all that that meant to COVID and then what that meant. I just find, like... That part of it is also super fascinating mm-hmm. how big events can just change a trajectory for where you, you're going and how your life ends up. I mean, yeah. Um, to put it in perspective, I had I was a CEO of a, uh, a, a very fast-growing, large Canadian youth charity that I co-founded. And we were up to, I don't know, 60 or 70 full-time staff. Like, yeah. it was really aggressive. We were in six or seven different countries taking a couple thousand youth a year to do projects. My my first book had just gone bestseller. So my trajectory for my career was was really on a, on a good path. And um, being faced with this decision after the earthquake to you know, basically live what I've been preaching yeah. or be a hypocrite. That's what I, That was the choice, ultimately. It wasn't even... I mean, yes, it was about compassion for Widleen and compassion for any disenfranchised person. But at the end of the day, I realize if I don't follow through and help this child, I'm everything I said is BS. I'm a, you know, it's I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. So that that natural disaster and the confluence of events that happened afterwards, like there's irony in it, not not ha ha irony, but terrible irony, I suppose. Yeah. But like something as simple as they had a three year moratorium. So our final Canadian papers were approved in November. Two months later, the earthquake happened. So my three-year expiration happened two months before the expiration of the moratorium. Like two months difference and we're home free. And Haiti adopted a three-year moratorium after natural disasters. They put it in their policy. I lobbied them to do that. Like I was one of the people that got them to do that because, you know, in the tsunami in Southeast Asia – Hundreds of thousands of kids went missing, not out to sea. They went off to brothels somewhere because people show up after natural disasters. When people are separated, children are separated from their caregivers, they can scoop them up and go, I'm here to help you. They put a Red Cross T-shirt on and they start scooping kids and putting them in a van. No one sees them again. So I actually was one of the people lobbying Haiti to adopt that policy. And two months later, I'm going, oh, can you make one exception? <laughs> you know, so that kind of stuff. But but it's those events um, I, I look back now and I can't imagine my life 
had the earthquake not happened. Mm. You know, I wouldn't change it. I mean, I, I would change not being shot at and have my teeth knocked out by the cops. I don't like that. No, those were less good. Yeah, Less yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, the entire experience as a whole has shaped who we are as a family, who I am as a human being. And we're all better for it. Uh, you know, the, the, it's the old adage, you, you go to the gym because resistance creates muscle. Well, we had a lot of resistance, I suppose. <laughs> we're going to find some muscle in there somewhere. How's everyone doing now? Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Luther's five. He's a baby genius. Uh, would lean. Just graduated high school last June. Uh, so she's got a Canadian high school diploma. She has a driver's license. She drives her own car. Um, and we are one step away from her final citizenship. We got citizenship uh, is split into two parts. Once you get to a point, then it's A and B. And A is the hardest one. And A was approved last week, if you can believe that. Mm. Timing is good. And which meant she got health care, which four years of being in Canada, she had no health care until last week. Wow. So that was a big victory for us. And this next one, a couple of months, she'll be a full Canadian with a passport and everything, I believe. Amazing. So she's super happy. And uh, yeah, great family. My wife is just a rock star and we're just doing our thing. You're doing your thing, and part of that's human, humanitarian work. So, right? Yeah. It's going to be hard to shake that, right? <laughs> yeah. So tell me a bit more about that and what you're doing. So, yeah, we get, it's, it's really weird because my wife, Nikki, and I had put together a business plan eight, eight, nine years ago for what we were calling the Silhouette Foundation. And it was very simple. Silhouette. You see a silhouette. You don't know if that uh, – you don't know the gender or the race, uh, anything of that person, the social economic status. It's just a silhouette. We want to treat people like that. We don't want to go with any preconceived ideas that we're going to help you if you say that or do that or your specific religion or whatever. So we put together this idea for a foundation. I mean, it's a 20-page business plan. It's very elaborate. And a couple of the main tenets were this. We wanted people in the Western world to be intelligent donors. If they're going to get behind a charity, we want them to know where their money goes mm. and know who's being helped by the money. We're, we're all sick and tired of these charities with bloated CEO salaries and private jets and that kind of crap, right? Well, nobody wants to see that anymore. We're done. No. And um, we put it together where we believe we could run a charity with a zero overhead by having for-profit stuff going on within the charity. So, like, I'm a public speaker. I go out and speak. That money goes towards the salaries. People donate. It goes right towards where they donated it to. So that we kind of put that together. Well, we're about to launch it. And then people started shooting at us. So we kind of had to put it on hold. And then we thought, oh, we'll launch it when we get back to Canada. We underestimated the amount of PTSD we had. And of course, mm. can't launch a global charity in the middle of a global pandemic anyways. So that wasn't going to work. So we had to percolate this vision for eight years. Last year, a gentleman who was on the board of directors for this Silhouette Foundation that we were been putting together called me up and he says, I need you to meet this guy in Toronto, man. I'm like, why? He goes, because I just spoke to him and I think he stole your idea. I'm like, okay, I'm interested. He said, I'm joking, but they're doing the same thing. Um, so we met this guy, and uh, they run Humanity International. And this gentleman had been running a, a marketing company, a branding and marketing company for 20-odd years, really successful. I mean, really successful. And he kind of had an epiphany moment where he said, I don't think I've been put on this earth to just make more money. Mm. So he launched this charity three years ago. And... Uh, He's he comes from um, the Muslim community prior, primarily, and so he was like you know getting a lot of his donations and projects were in that world, and he goes ah I still I don't think I'm here just for that world either, and then he met us and he says would you guys come on board, and just kind of help us take this thing as a make it a mainstream charity we don't want politics or religion to be a part of what we do, I have my religion it's why I do what I do you might have yours maybe you have none. We all know why we do what we do, but as an organization, we don't want to put filters on people. And and so it's crazy because Nikki and I had put this idea together. And right now, Humanity International, if someone gives a million bucks, we put a million bucks to the project they asked that they go to. We Our overhead is zeroed out by our the marketing company and then the other things we do to make money. So we are involved now in a charity that's working in over 20 countries. Um, we're adding new countries every couple of months, and we're in, in some edgy type stuff like – Gaza happens in October. Um, because we are fortunate enough to be UNHCR registered, we can get we can get project we can get money and not we don't want to send any money, but we can get like beds, mattresses, blankets, hot meals into the Gaza region when nobody else seems to be able to get it in there. So we're really on the cutting edge of doing some some cool, meaningful stuff, which is why I'm here. I want to get I want to tell people we're doing this, and I want to see if I can get other people involved. What do you think about operating, doing humanitarian work? 
in this point in time of the world that we're in, this time of polarization, this time of just everything kind of going on as we came out of this pandemic? Because like, you've been through a ton and you've been to, was it 70 mm-hmm. odd countries? 70 odd countries, yeah. Uh, to look at this point in time now, what do you think? Oh, it's a tough, it's tough because uh, I do my best not to be super political in the, in the humanitarian yeah. world, right? And I, I am a political person. I, I like being opinionated, <laughs> you know, I like arguing and stuff, but you can't, you can't put that filter on, on who you help and who you don't help. And honestly, I don't know if there's ever been a time in history that our world's been so divided. Like we are so divided. You can put up a picture of a water bottle on social media and someone will argue about it. Like, I mean, there's just, they want to fight about everything. And, um, the world's become so binary where like you got to be all left or all right. And, and nobody's got tolerance for anybody who might want to be in the middle or a little this or a little of that. So doing humanitarian work in that climate um, is difficult. It's very difficult because there's no right answer to anything. You know, I use Gaza for an example. I, I did a, a, a video campaign and I said to our guys at Humanity, I'm like, let me do an appeal for Gaza because... No one looking at me is going to think that guy's got skin in the game in Gaza. Mm. Right? I don't look like mm. I'm from there. I don't sound like I'm from there. Vaden Earl is not a Palestinian or Israeli name. <laughs> I don't know what it is, to be honest with you. But uh, <laughs> So I did some video appeals, and we raised a pile of money and sent some, some stuff to orphans in Gaza. And the hate mail that I got, I can't even tell you. Like it's, I got emails from people that I've known for my whole life saying, oh, I guess you're financing terrorism now. I'm like... Really? Like, and this is the, my philosophy is very simple about this. And I I answer questions long. Um, There's way more about us as humans that make us the same than divide us. Mm. We got to stop focusing on what divides us. We got to stop focusing on what makes us different. Like, I don't know why we as humans are obsessed with what makes us different. If we can just go, okay, yeah, you believe in that God. I believe in that God. You believe in no God or you're politically aligned left, I'm politically aligned right, or whatever. Can we all agree that children dying because of lack of food is a bad thing? I think we can all, can we all put our hands up to that one? Like, then let's let's sink our teeth into that and help that. Children being sold as as objects for pleasure, that's bad. We think I think we can all say that's bad. But um, it's tough. It's really tough to get people on the same page and, and agree to agree on the things we agree about. Yeah, well, in this world of... Uh... Very short attention spans, mm-hmm. right? In this world of memes that can yep. get, that will circulate through. In this world where a few months back you posted, uh, uh, I think it was on a biker patch, right? It said veterans before refugees, right? right. So, like it, it, so you have these little short phrases or whatever that, that are just meant to divide as opposed to what you're talking yeah. about, which is looking at a, a common denominator for folks of like, hey, kids should be able to be okay. Yeah. And that that post that I put up was I did it and I posted just the the image to try and rope in some of the people that think that way into the conversation. Veterans before refugees. I'm like, it's not like we're, you know, we're taking a veteran and kicking him out of his house on the street because we let someone from Libya come in. That's not how it works. And we don't need to say one before the other. We can say, let's try and help everybody. And uh, it's just, yeah, those like you said, those things out of context tiny snippets and memes and sound bites are meant to divide and they're very successful at doing that very successful when you do the work what kind of sticks with you from doing it like so with all the division but yeah. when you're out there doing the humanitarian work what's the stuff that stays with you when you're on the ground um there's very little of that there's very little of that division you when you're there and it's hitting the fan and like Nobody cares at that point about your religious affiliation, your political affiliation, your gender. Um, you're in a place where, hey, I need everybody's help to lift this piece of rock because someone's leg stuck under it from the earthquake. Everybody helps. So it's, it's pure when you're in crisis. It becomes pure. And honestly, I, this is going to sound a little political, but I, I don't want it to be. But here in this country we're afforded the luxury of being picky that, mm-hmm. because we're so wealthy. You know, we, we say, I'm not wealthy. I'm not wealthy. What we call the worst case scenario in Canada. Is it social assistance? Is it going on welfare? Is that the worst case? Or, you know, or, or close to it. If we go on Canadian social assistance today, we're in the top 1.2% wealthiest people in the world. Mm-hmm. Our worst case is not that bad. So we're afforded the luxury to sit and have an opinion about everything. And 
I go to places, go to Haiti right now. I mean, well, don't. <laughs> but if you could go to Haiti right now, no one's bickering about these things. It's in crisis. We don't, they don't have the luxury to sit down and commiserate about, oh, I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-life, I'm this and that. No. no, they're just trying to eat and survive. Yeah, I mean, when we'll talk about, like, you know, you look across the country. I mean, we do talk about there being, like, a housing homelessness crisis. We talk about uh, high levels of food insecurity. But then when you're, I mean, when you're talking about disaster zones mm-hmm. and, and, like, there is that other world to, to like, what can you can see and what can happen for how bad things can be post-earthquake mm-hmm. in developing countries or, or in, you know, uh, we're talking war zones. There, there, is a, there is a big, big difference between them. Yeah, the, and I'm camps. certainly not saying we don't have crisis no, here. No. And we do, we do need to address, uh, to me— like you said, homelessness, I think that's the most senseless thing in the world. That's got to be fixable. Like, I mean, it has yeah. to be fixable, right? I, I don't know why we haven't. Um, so we do have we do have a lot of those issues. But there is a line. Like you said, there's a line where we struggle in certain areas in North America to, to gain comfort. But nobody here, I don't believe, is going to die because they could not source a meal. Mm. And if they got that to that point and walked into a Tim Hortons and said, I'm going to die if I don't eat a donut, someone's going to give them a donut at the end yeah. of the day. Um, and that's just a survival is is um, not something that we need to fight for in Canada. Mm. Uh, the other thing I run into sometimes, I always think about, and I think about this personally for me too, right? Mm-hmm. Really, because we all have a bubble that we're in, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you try to, how do you, get through the bubble for folks to have them kind of, when you're doing your work, to have them understand what is happening and why it does matter for trying to give money to a charity or to care about other parts of the world that maybe we're not, we don't feel like we're connected to uh, like on, on the day to day. It's, um, I wish I knew the answer to that because I'm <laughs> trying to figure it out now. Yeah. I was good at it uh, for 20 years of doing this before being uh, banished, to <laughs> banished from my kingdom. Um, I was good at that. I was good at getting people to stop and maybe gain a perspective that's outside of the bubble. Mm. But something happened, and I think a lot of it came uh, came in like a tidal wave. With it was it was coming already, but COVID really amped it up um, because with COVID and and then you know even with the the populist era in the United States and and that kind of thinking, people became entitled. Mm. So. All of a sudden now, people became less trusting in institutional stuff like, um, you know, uh, you want me to take a vaccine for what? You want me? And everything was mistrust. So now, uh, before I could have a conversation or a public speaking gig for 45 minutes, and I could take people that may, may not really want to have compassion for people that look different than them, mm-hmm. and I can bring them to a point where they're like, you know what? I could, I could donate a couple hundred bucks to help that that child in Zimbabwe eat some meals hmm. and get to that point. Or I could sponsor a child with World Vision or whatever. I could get them to that point. Now, there's so much mistrust. We've gone back to this uh, tribalized kind of thinking where there's good and bad. You know, and then people, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud and people are going to hear it, but there's people that believe that we did something to deserve being born in Canada. Like we did something mm. to be here. We've we've earned this. <laughs> we were born. I mean, we we are nothing. We won the birth lottery, and that's yeah. my mantra. That's my rallying cry. We won the lottery, but maybe we can help someone that didn't even get a ticket. You know, like and uh, but there is the mistrust, and that's very difficult. So I get up and I say, um, you know, Turkey is a great example, or Turkey, they've now called it. Um, there was those earthquakes a couple of years ago, and we raised some funds. And people were like, well, I'm not sending my money there because they're all coming here and taking my jobs anyways. I'm like, oh, man, can we not get past that? Like, you know, and there's that mistrust in government, mistrust in immigration policies. And people are going, I don't, how do I know my money's going to the right place? And there's this mistrust. And that has become the bubble now I need to learn how to break. So, I'm, I mean, we're authentic. We're transparent in what we do with humanity. So people can look at our, our financial statements and, and that kind of thing. So we're trying, but it is. There's a mentality that's come in. And, again, I don't want to be political, but um, I, I'm terrified that we're going to see another four years of Trump and it's going to get worse, honestly, because that entitlement, I didn't like what that what that did for us. Yeah, because it's the difference from what you're saying, right? There's that that entitlement that you described yeah. compared to empathy and caring for humanity that you've been talking about for the yeah. course of this 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 hour. Yeah, and I tell and you know our um, 
our catchphrase over at the office is leave humanity better than you found it. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I've been shortening it to humanity first. And I say to the guys, and I'm, I'm working now closely with a lot of Muslims, with a lot of Hindus, a lot of really right-wing evangelical Christians, and I'm saying, can you look at people as humans first? And if they adhere to your faith, great. If they don't, that's they're still humans. They're still humans. And uh, when you know when we've got people winning elections based on putting up barriers to keep poor people away from rich people, that's that's not an indictment on that person. That's an indictment on us as a society. I think that we actually allow that to happen. So we're working on it, man. I don't know. I got I got politicians all over the place telling me don't go into politics because I I've always wanted to. Yeah. And they're like, don't do it. Do what you're doing. You're gonna waste your time. I'm like I don't know, man. We'll see. I I, don't, I just. I wish if I, if there's a message I could get to everybody on especially in the western more developed world it would just be that like just put humanity first we're just humans and if we could all work together and and I'm not talking about saying kumbaya all around a campfire I'm just talking about we could end some suffering like are we going to end global poverty maybe not we could end extreme poverty we could make it so that people aren't dying of poverty that's something we could do but uh, it's tough. We got some good people working on it. Like you got Bono there with you too. He's doing a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, we we had Mother Teresa. She was doing a lot. But again, there's people saying, "Oh, well, what are they doing it for? They're in it for the glory." I'm like, "Oh man, at least they're in it. <laughs> at least they're in the ring." Mm -hmm. So that's it's it's an uphill battle. Vaden and Earl, thank you so much for coming in, sitting down, and having this uh, conversation. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.